Thanks so much, Adam. And thanks to the organizers. Thanks to the Center for Contemporary Theory and the Center for the Study of Race, Culture, and Politics, uh, the Race and Capitalism Project, and the C3T uh, for hosting us here at the university and to the staff for taking care of us. Um, and thanks to the other panelists for joining us. And I'm really uh, excited to have this conversation. This is something that's been brewing for months. So, so grateful that we're here. So let's jump in. Um, so clear-headed discussions of strategy have to begin with correct analysis of objective conditions. Uh, right now, those conditions are alarming. Uh, the connection between climate change-induced migration from poor, predominantly black and brown countries with ascending white nationalism in Europe and the European settler colonies foretells uh, a future of climate catastrophe, democratic collapse, and globalized race war. If Trump's right-wing populism appeared, for a time at least, partly to speak to a genuine economic hardship, ever since he turned over his policy agenda to Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and an army of corporate lobbyists, he has revealed himself to be motivated really by two things. First of all, his own personal enrichment, and second, a fulminating white grievance politics anchored in ideas about white replacement uh, that shades easily into open white supremacism. For Trump and for other right-wing parties across the globe, their populism increasingly assumes overtly racist forms, often in the guise of so-called welfare chauvinism. That is a, a blatant ranking of human life based on race and citizenship. Um, like the Anglo-Saxon racialist of the Teddy Roosevelt era, for example, white nationalism will take the reality of nature's limits as an opportunity an argument for us to use uh, the force uh, uh, to hoard whatever resources that we have at our command, right? It will threaten wars, especially with China, and while it may still traffic in denunciations of a shadowy, presumably Jewish, globalist elite, it will not offer any material improvements in its constituents' lives. Instead, it will offer the psychic compensations of racial and gender violence. Unless they're interpreted, I'm sorry, unless they're interrupted, rather, white nationalism combined with the intensification of the climate and migration crisis would lead more and more to author authoritarian rule and the militarization of everyday life with dire consequences for those of us who are either marked as outsiders from the start or choose never to submit to live under such a system. All the while, the billionaires will continue their looting they will sooner invest in, for example, private armies, or literally, this is true, Martian colonies, <laughs> than consent to their wealth being appropriated for the sake of the planet and the people on it. We know that centrism cannot save us. Even as most mainstream democratic politicians come to realize that neoliberalism is an electoral dead end, they continue to play to elite audiences. What for them passes as bold ideas wouldn't alter the reality of diminished life prospects for the majority of the US population. Voters are not dumb. They see this. If we have four years of democratic control and no significant material improvement in the lives of most Americans, it could easily be followed by a right-wing presidency even scarier than the one we currently have, since that presidency likely would be competent. An old saying is increasingly new again. We will either have socialism or we will have barbarism. In this context, those of us who consider ourselves part of the left need to be very clear about our task. In my view, the task of the left at this juncture is to build and lead the broadest possible front of popular forces in a project of transforming the American state from one organized around capital accumulation without limit to one organized around mobilizing our collective capacities to green the earth and ensure the well-being of all people. We need to transform our nation with a politics rooted in dignity and solidarity and generosity and love, not greed, division, hate, extraction, war. A nation where every single one of us can thrive should be common sense and a common goal for all of us. So the phrase multiracial populism is, I would argue, a shorthand for one hypothesis about how, and one, there's many, hypotheses about how the left should undertake that task that I just shared. First of all, populism. 
Our goal here today is not to litigate competing definitions of the word populism. There are books flying off the presses about how populism, left and right, poses a threat to democracy. So perhaps we can all stipulate that we're in a populist moment, uh, a result of the abject failure of a whole series of ruling class projects that has cost them their popular legitimacy. In this moment, taken for granted arrangements are being called into question. Such a shift in popular consciousness represents an opening for the left that we should be working to widen. What populism means to me is that we should be working to build broad, durable majorities around a political program that directly challenges the power of the ruling class and their white Christian nationalist allies and points towards liberation for everyone else. One of the big questions we want to tackle today is how do we do that? What sets of demands create unity across difference? What approaches to organizing and movement building bring more and more people into long-term commitment to building power for the sake of saving the world? And is populism even the right term? My dear comrade, Barbara Ransby, who we're thrilled to have moderating the next panel, has a powerful critique of the word and our use of it. For my part, I think uh, of how we build this broad, durable majority involves the left shifting its orientation. The task of the left is not to organize or consolidate the left necessarily, but to organize the working class. Honest political struggle within the left is of course vital, but we shouldn't mistake it for building popular power. Sometimes our instinct to work harder at hashing things out amongst ourselves is an outward symptom of a deeper malaise. We doubt whether our politics are actually majority politics. So if we're serious about saving the world, we have to believe that they are. But holding onto that conviction when many of the people we need to organize hold beliefs that we reject can be deeply challenging. I think we build durable majorities by offering clear solutions to real problems in people's lives. This bill, for example, will completely wipe out your student debt. This one will mean you no longer have a giant deductible co copay. This one will make sure your childcare doesn't break the bank. This will make it easier to vote everywhere and ensure that every vote counts. This will tax giant fortunes to fund basic social goods. Bold structural changes will inspire the people who are looking for a political home. They will also fire up the people who are already with us and turn out our base and turn progressive voters into volunteers, small donors, and evangelicals on our side. Once we get folks in the door, we need to do something the right has done for, for decades, much better than us, and we need to be, uh, I think, sober about that, which is to invest in our people's political education over the long term. People know that things are badly broken, but we have not helped them understand in any nuanced and rigorous way why and what they could do about it. One of the things that we at the Working Families Party are working to, to do is to educate people about uh, one of the greatest political challenges we face, which is racial capitalism. This term gets invoked more and more, and not always with precision. My own view, shaped by many of the people in this room, uh, is that racial capitalism is a system in which race functions to establish material and status hierarchies within the broad working class. Specifically, under racial capitalism, all workers are exploited but black and brown workers are exploited, excluded, surveilled, dispossessed, incarcerated, and sometimes killed. White workers are treated as full citizens with the protection of the law, and large apparatuses are uh, devoted to facilitating their participation in at least some of the material benefits of American capitalism exist. The material discrepancies such a system produces are vast and built over generations. Witness the racial wealth gap, for, for example which is a material fact. But they also generate particular political pathologies. So specifically, they give rise to the profound conviction on the part of many white Americans that any program that would uplift all working people must inevitably come at their expense. This fear that equality for all represents a loss for some, even if it would make them materially better off, is an acute challenge for all of us, especially when a majority of white Americans are seeing their living standards erode. Under racial capitalism, the solidarities of whiteness and patriarchy, saturated with chauvinistic nationalism, 
always uh, potentially compete with the solidarity of class. So we have to also be sober about that tension and reality. In this in his open invitation to participate in the solidarity of whiteness, Trump has exploited this latent possibility like few other politicians in our history. And in the process, he has shown just how powerful it really can be. Its appeal cuts right through the electoral coalition we need to build if we have any hope of saving this country or the planet. Among many liberals and some leftists, there is a feeling that no one who has ever been tempted by the siren song of Trump can be allowed into our coalition. I'm not sure that we can afford such a stance. If for no other reason than the counter-majoritarian institution known as the US Senate exists. It is well known that the Senate gives disproportionate power to rural, predominantly, predominantly, uh, predominantly white states. The Republican Party has used this advantage to stack the courts with reactionaries. Right-wing control of the Senate and the courts together presents an enormous obstacle to any transformative political program. It also leaves white nationalists in control of levers they can use to continue to weaken majoritarian democracy. And we can't cede it to the right. And that means we will have to win votes in places where people don't automatically share our politics, especially on questions of race and racism. How do we do that without sacrificing our commitments to anti-racist politics? How do we ensure that people of color don't get thrown under the bus or even scapegoated, as has happened with populist movements in this country's past? To me, the multiracial and multiracial populism means that we will only build a powerful working class majority in this country by talking honestly about race and racism, not by avoiding the subject. My friend Heather McGee, who we're delighted to have with us today, makes this point with a memorable story. In the South, during the civil rights era, segregationists defunded, drained, and closed the public swimming pools rather than allow black people to swim together with white people. Now, no one could swim in them to this day, black or white. Those pools, literally and metaphorically, have never been refilled. Now, only the wealthy with a private pool or a country club can go swimming in those communities. This happens all the time in less visible ways. And when you talk to white people about it, they know it's true because they too have suffered the consequences of this decades-long program of starving public go goods for private gain. When we're silent and people are insecure, scared about what their slice looks like as the pie shrinks, the outcome isn't good for our side. We have no choice but to expose the right's racist tactics, to show how they've been using divide and conquer to drain the public pool for all of us. They say there isn't enough to go around, and someone else might get your share. That's what they say in their messaging, in their talking points. Trump does it masterfully. If we don't address with our own story, theirs, Trump's, the right wings will prevail. We need to tell our story, how they are stealing what belongs to all of us and putting us against one another uh, so that we could ignore what we have in common. In the very beginning, Black Lives Matter was a controversial chant even among progressives. I wouldn't say even among progressives, it was naturally among progressives and liberals. Some people said all lives matter might be more inclusive. And if we had poll tested, we might have found that all lives matter appealed to more people. But Black Lives Matter was a clear and succinct description of the problem we faced that our society wasn't valuing black lives and the change we wanted to see. This is what inspired millions to make a choice and get involved, and it changed the conversation. We are not in the business of making people comfortable. We are in the business of transforming people's consciousness, changing people's behavior, motivating, th they, motivating them to vote, to volunteer, to give, to join movements. That isn't to say there aren't foolish ways to communicate about race, and there are in a myriad of ways to alienate white voters when talking about race. Just like there are, there are plenty of ways to alienate black and native and Latinx voters when discussing race. We need to be intentional, thoughtful, rigorous, and nuanced. We need to tell a complete, honest story that all people can see themselves in. I'm extremely pleased that we're going to end the day with a discussion about the relationship between movements and electoral politics. Since stitching these things together is pretty much what I spend my days trying to accomplish. 
The political moment we're living through has created unusually favorable conditions. The Trump presidency has radicalized liberals and electoralized radicals. And my, my own view is that we need to marry the creative brilliance of movements, their ability to render the invisible visible and make the impossible possible with the power, rigor, and leadership development of labor and people's organizations, those three legs of a stool. People's movements, people's organizations, um, left labor, and, and social movements on the left. We need to give that marriage a political home built on deep trust that can bring uh, people, can, those people and those movements can bring their full selves into, but doesn't ask them to sacrifice their politics. That home needs to be a place where all of these forces can fashion non-delusional strategies for winning elections everywhere in America. That is, in any event, what we are aspiring to do at the Working Families Party. But we'd be at, uh, the last to deny that there are built-in contradictions to such an enterprise. Uh, and I face these contradictions every single day. In any case, in Brandon Johnson and Carlos Garcia, you have two brilliant examples of what that might look like. But I'll leave it to them to share their stories with you all. And now, let's dig into today's discussion. Thank you. <laughs>